contractor friends could handle, not only in Brigantine, but in Atlantic City as well. In 1977, Joe was working a job in Brigantine when Alfredo Ferraro walked over to him. Come here, Joe, there's somebody I want you to meet. Joe asked who it was. Philip's uncle, Alfredo replied. Joe followed him across the job site to where a small man in his 40s was squatting next to a concrete wall. He was clearly wealthy, and the other men at the site seemed to treat him with respect. Nicky, Alfredo greeted him. This is Joe Salerno. The man did not stand, and Joe had to stoop to shake his hand. What do you do, Salerno? he asked Joe. Joe said that he was a plumber. Good, Nicky replied. That's good. I hear you're a pretty nice guy. I'll do what I can for you. Joe thanked him and said that if he had any work, he could direct it to Alfredo. That's nice, Nicky nodded approvingly. I like that. Then he added confidingly, You know, it's all damn Irish down here, but you're my own kind. Anything I get, I'll throw it your way. They shook hands again, and Nicky left. Joe watched him drive off in a new black Cadillac sedan. He's a good man, Alfredo remarked. Joe knew that Philip's uncle Nicky was Nicodemo Scarfo, who controlled a cement contracting business in Atlantic City called Scarf Incorporated. He had never worked with a company, and apart from those few facts, he knew nothing about Nicky Scarfo or his business. Gambling brought changes not only to the shoreline, but to Joe Salerno's home as well. After the referendum passed, Joe's wife, Barbara, announced that she wanted to go to work as a dealer in the casinos. Joe did not like the idea, but he agreed to her going to school to learn the trade. There were three boys now, Johnny 11, Michael 10, and a baby, Tony. It was not long before the new schedule irritated Joe, and arguments began. The arguments grew into fights, and the fights became intolerable. Finally, Joe threatened to move out. Barbara called his bluff. Go ahead, she told him. Leave. Joe felt that he could not back down, yet he had no place to go, and there were his sons. Still, the situation at home had become impossible. That was when Philip Leonetti called. Uh, my uncle Nicky has a job for you, he said. He's got a problem at his place on Georgia Avenue. Joe drove over to Nicky Scarfo's brick apartment house at 26 North Georgia Avenue in Atlantic City. The plumbing was as ancient as the building, and the boiler had cracked. It was the winter of 1978, and Scarfo, his relatives, and his tenants were freezing. You're supposed to be a good plumber, Scarfo grumbled at Joe in the storefront office of Scarf Incorporated. Get the goddamn heat on. It was an enormous job. The boiler was a million BTUs and heavy as a battleship. Joe special ordered a new unit and then hired two men to help him disconnect the old one and haul it out. The job took five days of heavy, dangerous, dirty work, punctuated by Scarfo shouting down the vents, When are we gonna get that goddamn heat? Joe estimated the cost at $25,000 for equipment and labor. Scarfo paid Joe's discounted price for the boiler, but he offered nothing for the labor. Joe left the bill at the Scarf Incorporated office. The next day, Nicky's son, Chris, came to the job site where Joe was working and handed him back the bill. Across it was scrawled the words, Crime Don't Pay. Joe was bewildered. At first he thought it meant that Scarfo was accusing him of cheating, but he knew that was not so. Later, Joe showed the bill to his contractor friends and asked them what he should do about it. Alfredo Ferraro shook his head. Just don't do anything to upset the little guy, he told Joe. Vincent Falcone seemed to agree. Joe wanted to know what they were talking about. Look, Eddie Sapriso said, these guys are no good. You don't want to get too involved with them. The next time he saw Philip Leonetti, Joe mentioned the bill. We'll make it up to you some other way, Leonetti told him. I got an idea, Philip said. A friend of my uncle's got a house in Margate, needs some plumbing work. You can stay there while you do the work. The friend was Salvatore Chucky Merlino. He moved into Chucky Merlino's house in September and began to spend more time with his contractor friends, including the group at Scarf Incorporated. When the work on the Margate house was done and Chucky was ready to return, Joe again had to find a place to live. This time, Nicky himself suggested a solution. Listen, Joe, he said one day at the Scarf Incorporated office, forget about your wife and don't worry about your kids. They'll be all right. You come and stay here. We'll take care of you. He offered to rent Joe an apartment at 26 North Georgia Avenue for $200 a month. In his distraught state of mind, Joe accepted both the apartment and the implied offer of a closer relationship with Scarfo and his associates. 
It was the beginning of a manipulation that was to grow more complex and pointed as the months went on. At the time he met Joe Salerno, Nicky Scarfo was building an army to use in his conquest of Atlantic City. Scarfo was working to create a counterweight in Atlantic City to Angelo Bruno's fading authority in Philadelphia. To do this, Scarfo had to recruit as many soldiers as he could, as quickly as possible. This recruiting campaign was not accidental or haphazard, as Joe Salerno would eventually realize. It was a carefully plotted and ruthlessly executed scheme to wed troops to Scarfo in such a way that divorce was impossible. Joe began using the office at Scarf Incorporated as a business contact point. Nicky was finding him plumbing jobs in the frantic casino construction boom, and Joe was also being integrated into Scarfo's circle. He was even invited to the regular Sunday dinners at Scarfo's apartment. The next step in Scarfo's seduction of Joe Salerno came when a contractor defaulted on Joe. In the midst of a major plumbing job Joe was doing in the affluent coast town of Longport, the general contractor suddenly went bankrupt. Joe was left with $45,000 in obligations for materials and labor, which he paid off. Other bills were piling up, and the mortgage payments on his house in Brigantine were falling behind. By Christmas of 1978, Joe needed cash badly. Joe knew by now that Philip Leonetti had friends who loaned money at steep interest. He went to Philip and explained his problem. How much do you need, Philip asked. Joe told him he could get by with $10,000. I'll see what I can do, Philip said. Leonetti returned in 20 minutes. Philip drew an envelope from the front of his trousers and handed it to Joe. In the envelope were a hundred one hundred dollar bills. Interest on this is usually five hundred a week, Philip said. But since you're a friend, I got it for two fifty. It's the best I could do. Even this rate meant that the debt would double in ten months. But Joe had some big jobs coming up, and he expected to be able to pay Philip back quickly. He did not ask, nor did Leonetti volunteer, where the money had come from. 1979 brought a new way of life for Joe. During the day, he worked out of Scarf Incorporated, trying to pay his debts and keep his business afloat. The evenings he spent with Scarfo, Philip, and Chucky and Lawrence Merlino. They were usually joined by Alfredo Ferraro and Vincent Falcone. Later in the evening, after the group had broken up, Joe would go to his house in Brigantine to visit with his wife and sons. His encounters with Barbara were not happy ones. Occasionally, after one of the Sunday dinners at 26 North Georgia Avenue, Nicky would take Joe to the window, which overlooked the casino skyline. You see this, Joe? He would say, gesturing toward the city. One day, I'm going to own this place. These suggestive, vaguely cynical...